Fox's Book of Martyrs. Persecutions in England during the reign of Queen Mary. The premature death of that celebrated young monarch, Edward VI, occasioned the most extraordinary and wonderful occurrences which had ever existed from the times of our blessed Lord and Savior's incarnation in human shape. This melancholy event became speedily a subject of general regret. The succession to the British throne was soon made a matter of contention, and the scenes which ensued were a demonstration of the serious affliction in which the kingdom was involved. As his loss to the nation was more and more unfolded, the remembrance of his government was more and more the basis of grateful recollection. The very awful prospect, which was soon presented to the friends of Edward's administration, under the direction of his counselors and servants, was a contemplation which the reflecting mind was compelled to regard with most alarming apprehensions. The rapid approaches which were made towards a total reversion of the proceedings of the young king's reign, denoted the advances which were thereby represented to an entire resolution in the management of public affairs both in church and state. Alarmed for the condition in which the kingdom was likely to be involved by the king's death and endeavoured to prevent the consequences, which were but too plainly foreseen, was productive of the most serious and fatal effects. The king, in his long and lingering affliction, was induced to make a will, by which he bequeathed the English crown to Lady Jane, the daughter of the Duke of Suffolk who had been married to Lord Guilford, the son of the Duke of Northumberland, and was the granddaughter of the second sister of King Henry, by Charles, Duke of Suffolk. By this will, the succession of Mary and Elizabeth, his two sisters, was entirely superseded, from an apprehension of the returning system of popery, and the king's council, with the chief of the nobility, the Lord Mayor of the City of London, and almost all the judges and the principal lawyers of the realm, subscribed their names to this regulation, as a sanction to the measure. Lord Chief Justice Hale, though a true Protestant and an upright judge, alone declined to unite his name in favour of the Lady Jane, because he had already signified his opinion that Mary was entitled to assume the reins of government. Others objected to Mary's being placed on the throne, on account of their fears that she might marry a foreigner, and thereby bring the crown into considerable danger. Her partiality to popery also left little doubt on the minds of any, that she would be induced to revive the dormant interests of the Pope and change the religion which had been used both in the days of her father, King Henry, and in those of her brother Edward, for in all this time she had manifested the greatest stubbornness and inflexibility of temper, as must be obvious from her letter to the Lords of the Council, whereby she put in her claim to the crown on her brother's decease. When this happened, the nobles, who had associated to prevent Mary's succession, and had been instrumental in promoting, and, perhaps, advising the measures of Edward, speedily proceeded to proclaim Lady Jane Grey, to be Queen of England, in the city of London and various other populous cities of the realm. Though young, she possessed talents of a very superior nature, and her improvements under a most excellent tutor had given her many very great advantages. Her reign was of only five days continuance, for Mary, having succeeded by false promises in obtaining the crown, speedily commenced the execution of her avowed intention of extirpating and burning every Protestant. She was crowned at Westminster in the usual form, and her elevation was the signal for the commencement of the bloody persecution which followed. Having obtained the sword of authority, she was not sparing in its exercise. The supporters of Lady Jane Grey were destined to feel its force. The Duke of Northumberland was the first who experienced her savage resentment. Within a month after his confinement in the tower, he was condemned and brought to the scaffold to suffer as a traitor. From his varied crimes, resulting out of a sordid and inordinate ambition, he died unpitied and unlamented. The changes, which followed with rapidity, unequivocally declared that the Queen was disaffected to the present state of religion. Dr. Poynett was displaced to make room for Gardiner to be Bishop of Winchester, to whom she also gave the important office of Lord Chancellor. Dr. Ridley was dismissed from the See of London, and Bonn introduced. Jay's story was put out of the Bishopric of Chichester, to admit Dr. Day. Jay Hooper was sent prisoner to the fleet, and Dr. Heath put into the See of Worcester. Miles Coverdale was also excluded from Exeter, and Dr. Vesey placed in that diocese. Dr. Tunstall was also promoted to the See of Durham. These things being marked and perceived, great heaviness and discomfort grew more and more to all good men's hearts, but to the wicked great rejoicing. They that could dissemble took no great care how the matter went, but such, whose consciences were joined with the truth, perceived already coals to be kindled, which after should be the destruction of many a true Christian.
the words and behavior of the Lady Jane upon the scaffold. The next victim was the amiable Lady Jane Grey, who, by her acceptance of the crown at the earnest solicitations of her friends, incurred the implacable resentment of the Bloody Mary. When she first mounted the scaffold, she spoke to the spectators in this manner, Good people, I am come hither to die, and by a law I am condemned to the same. The fact against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and the consenting thereunto by me, but, touching the procurement and desire thereof by me, or on my behalf, I do wash my hands thereof in innocency before God, and the face of you, good Christian people, this day, and therewith she wrung her hands, wherein she had her book. Then said she, I pray you all, good Christian people, to bear me witness, that I die a good Christian woman, and that I do look to be saved by no other mean, but only by the mercy of God in the blood of his only Son Jesus Christ, and I confess that when I did know the word of God, I neglected the same, loved myself and the world, and therefore this plague and punishment is happily and worthily happened unto me for my sins, and yet I thank God, that of his goodness he hath thus given me a time and a respite to repent. And now, good people, while I am alive, I pray you assist me with your prayers. And then, kneeling down, she turned to Feckenham, saying, Shall I say this psalm? And he said, Yeah. Then she said the psalm of Miserere Medeus, in English, in a most devout manner throughout to the end, and then she stood up, and gave her maid, Mrs. Ellen, her gloves and handkerchief, and her book to Mr. Bruges, and then she untied he gown, and the executioner pressed upon her to help her off with it, but she, desiring him to let her alone, turned towards her two gentlewomen, who helped her off therewith and also with her froze, paft, and neckerchief, giving to her a fair handkerchief to put about her eyes. Then the executioner kneeled down, and asked her forgiveness, whom she forgave most willingly. Then he desired her to stand upon the straw, which doing, she saw the block. Then she said, I pray you, dispatch me quickly. Then she kneeled down, saying, Will you take it off before I lay me down? And the executioner said, No, madam. Then she tied a handkerchief about her eyes, and feeling for the block, she said, What shall I do? Where is it? Where is it? One of the standers by guiding her thereunto, she laid her head upon the block, and then stretched forth her body, and said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and so finished her life, in the year of our Lord 1554, the twelfth day of February, about the seventeenth year of her age. Thus died Lady Jane, and on the same day Lord Guilford, her husband, one of the Duke of Northumberland's sons, was likewise beheaded, two innocents in comparison with them that sat upon them. For they were both very young, and ignorantly accepted that which others had contrived, and by open proclamation consented to take from others, and give to them. Touching the condemnation of this pious lady, it is to be noted that Judge Morgan, who gave sentence against her, soon after he had condemned her, fell mad, and in his raving cried out continually to have the Lady Jane taken away from him, and so he ended his life. On the twenty-first day of the same month, Henry, Duke of Suffolk, was beheaded on Tower Hill, the fourth day after his condemnation, about which time many gentlemen and yeomen were condemned, whereof some were executed at London, and some in the country. In the number of whom was Lord Thomas Gray, brother to the said Duke, being apprehended not long after in North Wales, and executed for the same. Sir Nicholas Frogmorton, also, very narrowly escaped. John Rogers, Vicar of St. Sepulchre's, and Reader of St. Paul's, London. John Rogers was educated at Cambridge, and was afterward many years chaplain to the merchant adventurers at Antwerp in Brabant. Here he met with the celebrated martyr William Tyndall and Miles Coverdale, both voluntary exiles from their country for their aversion to popish superstition and idolatry. They were the instruments of his conversion, and he united with them in that translation of the Bible into English, entitled The Translation of Thomas Matthew. From the scriptures he knew that unlawful vows may be lawfully broken, hence he married, and removed to Wittenberg in Saxony, for the improvement of learning, and he there learned the Dutch language, and received the charge of a congregation, which he faithfully executed for many years. On King Edward's accession, he left Saxony to promote the work of reformation in England, and, after some time, Nicholas Ridley, then Bishop of London, gave him a prebend in St. Paul's Cathedral, and the dean and chapter appointed him reader of the divinity lesson there. Here he continued until Queen Mary's succession to the throne, when the gospel and true religion were banished, and the Antichrist of Rome, with his superstition and idolatry, introduced. The circumstance of Mr. Rogers having preached at Paul's Cross, after Queen Mary arrived at the Tower, has been already stated. 
He confirmed in his sermon the true doctrine taught in King Edward's time, and exhorted the people to beware of the pestilence of popery, idolatry, and superstition. For this he was called to account, but so ably defended himself that, for that time, he was dismissed. The proclamation of the Queen, however, to prohibit true preaching, gave his enemies a new handle against him. Hence he was again summoned before the council, and commanded to keep his house. He did so, though he might have escaped, and though he perceived the state of the true religion to be desperate. Heck knew he could not want a living in Germany, and he could not forget a wife and ten children, and to seek means to succor them. But all these things were insufficient to induce him to depart, and, when once called to answer in Christ's cause, he stoutly defended it, and hazarded his life for that purpose. After long imprisonment in his own house, the restless Bonner, Bishop of London, caused him to be committed to Newgate, there to be lodged among thieves and murderers. After Mr. Rogers had been long and straitly imprisoned, and lodged in Newgate among thieves, often examined, and very uncharitably entreated, and at length unjustly and most cruelly condemned by Stephen Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, the fourth day of February, in the year of our Lord 1555, being Monday in the morning, he was suddenly warned by the keeper of Newgate's wife, to prepare himself for the fire, who, being then sound asleep, could scarce be awaked. At length being raised and awaked, and bid to make haste, then said he, I if it be so, I need not tie my points. And so was it down, first to Bishop Bonner to be degraded, which being done, he craved of Bonner but one petition, and Bonner asked what that should be. Mr. Rogers replied that he might speak a few words with his wife before his burning, but that could not be obtained of him. When the time came that he should be brought out of Newgate to Smithfield, the place of his execution, Mr. Woodruff, one of the sheriffs, first came to Mr. Rogers, and asked him if he would revoke his abominable doctrine, and the evil opinion of the sacrament of the altar. Mr. Rogers answered, That which I have preached I will seal with my blood. Then Mr. Woodruff said, Thou art an heretic. That shall be known, quoth Mr. Rogers, at the day of judgment. Well, said Mr. Woodruff, I will never pray for thee. But I will pray for you, said Mr. Rogers, and so was brought the same day, the 4th of February, by the sheriffs, towards Smithfield, saying the psalm miserere by the way, all the people wonderfully rejoicing at his constancy, with great praises and thanks to God for the same. And there in the presence of Mr. Rochester, comptroller of the Queen's household, Sir Richard Southwell, both the sheriffs, and a great number of people, he was burnt to ashes, washing his hands in the flame as he was burning. A little before his burning, his pardon was brought, if he would have recanted, but he utterly refused it. He was the first martyr of all the blessed company that suffered in Queen Mary's time that gave the first adventure upon the fire. His wife and children, being eleven in number, ten able to go, and one sucking at her breast, met him by the way, as he went towards Smithfield. Tigai's sorrowful sight of his own flesh and blood could nothing move him, but that he constantly and cheerfully took his death with wonderful patience, in the defense and quarrel of the gospel of Christ. The Reverend Lawrence Saunders Mr. Saunders, after passing some time in the school of Eton, was chosen to go to King's College in Cambridge, where he continued three years, and profited in knowledge and learning very much for that time. Shortly after he quitted the university, and went to his parents, but soon returned to Cambridge again to his study, where he began to add to the knowledge of the Latin, the study of the Greek and Hebrew tongues, and gave himself up to the study of the Holy Scriptures, the better to qualify himself for the office of preacher. In the beginning of King Edward's reign, when God's true religion was introduced, after license obtained, he began to preach, and was so well liked of them who then had authority that they appointed him to read a divinity lecture in the College of Fortheringham. The College of Fotheringham being dissolved he was placed to be a reader in the minster at Lichfield. After a certain space, he departed from Lichfield to a benefice in Leicestershire, called Church Langton, where he held a residence, taught diligently, and kept a liberal house. Thence he was orderly called to take a benefice in the city of London, namely, All Hallows in Bread Street. After this he preached at Northampton, nothing meddling with the state, but boldly uttering his conscience against the popish doctrines which were likely to spring up again in England, as a just plague for the little love which the English nation then bore to the blessed word of God which had been so plentifully offered unto them. The Queen's party who were there, and heard him, were highly displeased with him for his sermon, and for it kept him among them as a prisoner. But partly for love of his brethren and friends, who were chief actors for the Queen among them, and partly because there was no law broken by beast preaching, they dismissed him. 
Some of his friends, perceiving such fearful menacing, counseled him to fly out of the realm, which he refused to do. But seeing he was with violence kept from doing good in that place, he returned towards London to visit his flock. In the afternoon of Sunday, October 15, 1554, as he was reading in his church to exhort his people, the Bishop of London interrupted him by sending an officer for him. His treason and sedition the bishop's charity was content to let slip until another time, but a heretic he meant to prove him, and all those, he said, who taught and believed that the administration of the sacraments, and all orders of the church, are the most pure, which come the nearest to the order of the primitive church. After much talk concerning this matter, the bishop desired him to write what he believed of transubstantiation. Lawrence Saunders did so, saying, My lord, you seek my blood, and you shall have it, I pray God that you may be so baptized in it that you may ever after loathe bloodsucking and become a better man. Upon being closely charged with contumacy, the severe replies of Mr. Saunders to the bishop who had before, to get the favor of Henry VIII written and set forth in print, a book of true obedience, wherein he had openly declared Queen Mary to be a bastard, so irritated him that he exclaimed, Carry away this frenzied fool to prison. After this good and faithful martyr had been kept in prison one year and a quarter, the bishops at length called him, as they did his fellow prisoners, openly to be examined before the Queen's council. His examination being ended, the officers led him out of the place, and stayed until the rest of his fellow prisoners were likewise examined, that they might lead them all together to prison. After his excommunication and delivery over to the secular power, he was brought by the Sheriff of London to the Counter, a prison in his own parish of Bread Street, at which he rejoiced greatly, both because he found there a fellow prisoner, Mr. Cardmaker, with whom he had much Christian and comfortable discourse, and because out of prison, as before in his pulpit, he might have an opportunity of preaching to his parishioners. On the 4th of February, Bonner, Bishop of London, came to the prison to degrade him, the day following, in the morning the Sheriff of London delivered him to certain of the Queen's Guard, who were appointed to carry him to the city of Coventry, there to be burnt. When they had arrived at Coventry, a poor shoemaker, who used to serve him with shoes, came to him, and said, O oh my good master, God strengthen and comfort you. Good shoemaker, mister. Saunders replied, I desire thee to pray for me, for I am the most unfit man for this high office, that ever was appointed to it, but my gracious God and dear Father is able to make me strong enough. The next day, being the 8th of February, 1555, he was led to the place of execution, in the park, without the city. He went in an old gown and a shirt, barefooted, and oftentimes fell flat on the ground, and prayed. When he was come to nigh the place, the officer, appointed to see the execution done, said to Mr. Saunders that he was one of them who marred the Queen's realm, but if he would recant, there was pardon for him. Not I, replied the holy martyr, but such as you have injured the realm. The blessed gospel of Christ is what I hold, that do I believe, that have I taught, and that will I never revoke. Mr. Saunders then slowly moved towards the fire, sank to the earth and prayed, he then rose up, embraced the stake, and frequently said, Welcome, thou cross of Christ. Welcome everlasting life. Fire was then put to the faggots, and, he was overwhelmed by the dreadful flames, and sweetly slept in the Lord Jesus. The History, Imprisonment, and Examination of Mr. John Hooper, Bishop of Worcester and Gloucester. John Hooper, student and graduate in the University of Oxford, was stirred with such fervent desire to the love and knowledge of the scriptures that he was compelled to move from thence, and was retained in the house of Sir Thomas Arundel, as his steward, until Sir Thomas had intelligence of his opinions and religion, which he in no case did favor, though he exceedingly favored his person and condition and wished to be his friend. Mr. Hooper now prudently left Sir Thomas's house and arrived at Paris, but in a short time returned to England, and was retained by Mr. Sentlow, until the time that he was again molested and sought for, when he passed through France to the higher parts of Germany, where, commencing acquaintance with learned men, he was by them free and lovingly entertained, both at Basel, and especially at Zurich, by Mr. Bullinger, who was his singular friend, here also he married his wife, who was a Burgonian, and applied very studiously to the Hebrew tongue. At length, when God saw it good to stay the bloody time of the six articles, and to give us King Edward to reign over this realm, with some peace and rest unto the church, amongst many other English exiles, who then repaired homeward, Mr. Hooper also, moved in conscience, thought not to absent himself, but seeing such a time and occasion, offered to help forward the Lord's work, to the uttermost of his ability. When Mr. Hooper had taken his farewell of Mr.
Bullinger, and his friends in Zurich, he repaired again to England in the reign of King Edward VI, and coming to London, used continually to preach, most times twice, or at least once a day. In his sermons, according to his accustomed manner, he corrected sin, and sharply inveighed against the iniquity of the world and the corrupt abuses of the church. The people in great flocks and companies daily came to hear his voice, as the most melodious sound and tune of Orpheus' harp, insomuch, that oftentimes when he was preaching, the church would be so full that none could enter farther than the doors thereof. In his doctrine he was earnest, in tongue eloquent, in the scriptures perfect, in pains indefatigable, in his life exemplary. Having preached before the king's majesty, he was soon after made bishop of Gloucester. In that office he continued two years, and behaved himself so well that his very enemies could find no fault with him, and after that he was made bishop of Worcester. Dr. Hooper executed the office of a most careful and vigilant pastor, for the space of two years and more, as long as the state of religion in King Edward's time was sound and flourishing. After he had been cited to appear before Bonner and Dr. Heath, he was led to the council, accused falsely of owing the Queen money, and in the next year, 1554, he wrote an account of his severe treatment during their 18 months' confinement in the fleet, and after his third examination, January 28, 1555, at St. Mary Overy's, he, with the Reverend Mr. Rogers, was conducted to the Comptor in Southwark, there to remain until the next day at nine o'clock, to see whether they would recant. Come, Brother Rogers, said Dr. Hooper, must we too take this matter first in hand, and begin to fry in these faggots? Yes, doctor, said Mr. Rogers, by God's grace. Doubt not, said Dr. Hooper, but God will give us strength, and the people so applauded their constancy that they had much ado to pass. January 29th, Bishop Hooper was degraded and condemned, and the Reverend Mr. Rogers was treated in like manner. At dark, Dr. Hooper was led through the city to Newgate, notwithstanding this secrecy, many people came forth to their doors with lights, and saluted him, praising God for his constancy. During the few days he was in Newgate, he was frequently visited by Bonner and others, but without avail. As Christ was tempted, so they tempted him, and then maliciously reported that he had recanted. The place of his martyrdom being fixed at Gloucester, he rejoiced very much, lifting up his eyes and hands to heaven, and praising God that he saw it good to send him among the people over whom he was pastor, there to confirm with his death the truth which he had before taught them. On February 7th, he came to Gloucester, about five o'clock, and lodged at one Ingram's house. After his first sleep, he continued in prayer until morning, and all the day, except a little time at his meals, and when conversing such as the guard kindly permitted to speak to him, he spent in prayer. Sir Anthony Kingston, at one time Dr. Hooper's good friend, was appointed by the Queen's letters to attend at his execution. As soon as he saw the bishop he burst into tears. With tender entreaties he exhorted him to live. True it is, said the bishop, that death is bitter, and life is sweet, but alas! Consider that the death to come is more bitter, and the life to come is more sweet. The same day a blind boy obtained leave to be brought into Dr. Hooper's presence. The same boy, not long before, had suffered imprisonment at Gloucester for confessing the truth. Ah! Poor boy, said the bishop, though God hath taken from me thy outward sight, for what reason he best knoweth, yet he hath endued thy soul with the eye of knowledge and of faith. God give thee grace continually to pray unto him, that thou lose not that sight, for then wouldst thou indeed be blind both in body and soul. When the mayor waited upon him preparatory to his execution, he expressed his perfect obedience, and only requested that a quick fire might terminate his torments. After he had got up in the morning, he desired that no man should be suffered to come into the chamber, that he might be solitary until the hour of execution. About eight o'clock, on February 9, 1555, he was led forth, and many thousand persons were collected, as it was market day. All the way, being straightly charged not to speak, and beholding the people, who mourned bitterly for him, he would sometimes lift up his eyes towards heaven, and look very cheerfully upon such as he knew, and he was never known, during the time of his being among them, to look with so cheerful and ruddy a countenance as he did at that time. When he came to the place appointed where he should die, he smilingly beheld the stake and preparation made for him, which was near unto the great elm tree over against the college of priests, where he used to preach. Now, after he had entered into prayer, a box was brought and laid before him upon a stool, with his pardon from the queen, if he would turn. At the sight whereof he cried, If you love my soul, away with it. 
The box being taken away, Lord Shandoy said, seeing there is no remedy, dispatch him quickly. Command was now given that the fire should be kindled. But because there were not more green faggots than two horses could carry, it kindled not speedily, and was a pretty while also before it took the reeds upon the faggots. At length it burned about him, but the wind having full strength at that place, and being a lowering cold morning, it blew the flame from him, so that he was in a manner little more than touched by the fire. Within a space after, a few dry faggots were brought, and a new fire kindled with faggots, for there were no more reeds, and those burned at the nether parts, but had small power above, because of the wind, saving that it burnt his hair and scorched his skin a little. In the time of which fire, even as at the first flame, he prayed, saying mildly, and not very loud, but as one without pain, O Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me, and receive my soul. After the second fire was spent, he wiped both his eyes with his hands, and beholding the people, he said with an indifferent, loud voice, For God's love, good people, let me have more fire, and all this while his nether parts did burn, but the faggots were so few that the flame only singed his upper parts. The third fire was kindled within a while after, which was more extreme than the other two. In this fire he prayed with a loud voice, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And these were the last words he was heard to utter. But when he was black in the mouth, and his tongue so swollen that he could not speak, yet his lips went until they were shrunk to the gums, and he knocked his breast with his hands until one of his arms fell off, and then knocked still with the other, while the fat, water, and blood dropped out at his fingers' ends, until by renewing the fire, his strength was gone, and his hand clave fast in knocking to the iron upon his breast. Then immediately bowing forwards, he yielded up his spirit. Thus was he three quarters of an hour or more in the fire. Even as a lamb, patiently he abode the extremity thereof, neither moving forwards, backwards, nor to any side, but he died as quietly as a child in his bed. And he now reigneth, I doubt not, as a blessed martyr in the joys of heaven, prepared for the faithful in Christ before the foundations of the world, for whose constancy all Christians are bound to praise God. The Life and Conduct of Dr. Roland Taylor of Hadley Dr. Roland Taylor, vicar of Hadley, in Suffolk, was a man of eminent learning, and had been admitted to the degree of doctor of the civil and canon law. His attachment to the pure and uncorrupted principles of Christianity recommended him to the favor and friendship of Dr. Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, with whom he lived a considerable time, until through his interest he obtained the living in Hadley. Not only was his word a preaching unto them, but all his life and conversation was an example of unfeigned Christian life and true holiness. He was void of all pride, humble and meek as any child, so that none were so poor but they might boldly, as under their father, resort unto him, neither was his lowliness childish or fearful, but, as occasion, time, and place required, he would be stout in rebuking the sinful and evildoers, so that none was so rich but he would tell them plainly his fault, with such earnest and grave rebukes as became a good curate and pastor. He was a man very mild, void of all rancor, grudge or evil will, ready to do good to all men, readily forgiving his enemies, and never sought to do evil to any. To the poor that were blind, lame, sick, bedrid, or that had many children, he was a very father, a careful patron, and diligent provider, insomuch that he caused the parishioners to make a general provision for them, and he himself, beside the continual relief that they always found at his house, gave an honest portion yearly to the common almsbox. His wife also was an honest, discreet, and sober matron, and his children well nurtured, brought up in the fear of God and good learning. He was a good salt of the earth, savorly biting the corrupt manners of evil men, a light in God's house, set upon a candlestick for all good men to imitate and follow. Thus continued this good shepherd among his flock, governing and leadening them through the wilderness of this wicked world, all the days of the most innocent and holy king of blessed memory, Edward VI. But on his demise, and the succession of Queen Mary to the throne, he escaped not the cloud that burst on so many bestai, for two of his parishioners, Foster, an attorney, and Clark, a tradesman, out of blind zeal, resolved that Mass should be celebrated, in all its superstitious forms, in the parish church of Hadley, on Monday before Easter. This Dr. Taylor, entering the church, strictly forbade, but Clark forced the doctor out of the church, celebrated Mass, and immediately informed the Lord Chancellor, Bishop of Winchester of his behavior, who summoned him to appear, and answer the complaints that were alleged against him. The doctor upon the receipt of the summons, cheerfully prepared to obey the same, and rejected the advice of his friends to fly beyond sea. When Gardiner saw Dr. Taylor, he, 
according to his common custom, reviled him. Dr. Taylor heard his abuse patiently, and when the bishop said, How darest thou look me in the face? Knowest thou not who I am? Dr. Taylor replied, You are Dr. Stephen Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, and Lord Chancellor, and yet but a mortal man. But if I should be afraid of your lordly looks, why fear ye not God, the Lord of us all? With what countenance will you appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and answer to your oath made first unto King Henry the Eighth? and afterward unto King Edward the Sixth, his son? A long conversation ensued, in which Dr. Taylor was so piously collected and severe upon his antagonist, that he exclaimed, Thou art a blasphemous heretic. Thou indeed blasphemest the blessed sacrament, here he put off his cap, and speakest against the holy mass, which is made a sacrifice for the quick and the dead. The bishop afterward committed him into the king's bench. When Dr. Taylor came there, he found the virtuous and vigilant preacher of God's word, Mr. Bradford, who equally thanked God that he had provided him with such a comfortable fellow prisoner, and they both together praised God, and continued in prayer, reading, and exhorting one another. After Dr. Taylor had lain some time in prison, he was cited to appear in the arches of Bowchurch. Dr. Taylor, being condemned, was committed to the clink, and the keepers were charged to treat him roughly, at night he was removed to the poultry counter. When Dr. Taylor had lain in the counter about a week on the 4th of February, Bonner came to degrade him, bringing with him such ornaments as appertained to the massing mummery, but the doctor refused these trappings until they were forced upon him. The night after he was degraded his wife came with John Hall, his servant, and his son Thomas, and were by the gentleness of the keepers permitted to sup with him. After supper, walking up and down, he gave God thanks for his grace that had given him strength to abide by his holy word. With tears they prayed together, and kissed one another. Unto his son Thomas he gave a Latin book, containing the notable sayings of the old martyrs, and in the end of that he wrote his testament. I say to my wife, and to my children, the Lord gave you unto me, and the Lord hath taken me from you, and you from me, blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe that they are blessed which die in the Lord. God careth for sparrows, and for the hairs of our heads. I have ever found him more faithful and favorable than is any father or husband. Trust ye therefore in him by the means of our dear Saviour Christ's merits, believe, love, fear, and obey him, pray to him, for he hath promised to help. Count me not dead, for I shall certainly live and never die. I go before, and you shall follow after, to our long home. On the morrow the Sheriff of London with his officers came to the counter by two o'clock in the morning, and brought forth Dr. Taylor and without any light led him to the woolsack, and in without Aldgate. Dr. Taylor's wife, suspecting that her husband should that night be carried away, watched all night in St. Botolph's church porch beside Aldgate, having her two children, the one named Elizabeth, of thirteen years of age, whom, being left without father or mother, Dr. Taylor had brought up of arms from three years old, the other named Mary, Dr. Taylor's own daughter. Now, when the sheriff and his company came against St. Botolph's church, Elizabeth cried, saying, O oh my dear father! Mother, mother, here is my father led away. Then his wife cried, Roland, Roland, where art thou? For it was a very dark morning, that the one could not well see the other. Dr. Taylor answered, Dear wife, I am here, and stayed. The sheriff's men would have led him forth, but the sheriff said, Stay a little, masters, I pray you, and let him speak to his wife, and so they stayed. Then came she to him, and he took his daughter Mary in his arms, and he, his wife, and Elizabeth kneeled down and said the Lord's Prayer, at which sight the sheriff wept to pace, and so did divers others of the company. After they had prayed, he rose up and kissed his wife, and shook her by the hand, and said, Farewell, my dear wife, be of good comfort, for I am quiet in my conscience. God shall stir up a father for my children. All the way Dr. Taylor was joyful and merry as one that counted himself going to a most pleasant banquet or bridal. He spake many notable things to the sheriff and yeoman of the guard that conducted him, and often moved them to weep, through his much earnest calling upon them to repent, and to amend their evil and wicked living. Oftentimes also he caused them to wonder and rejoice, to see him so constant and steadfast, void of all fear, joyful in heart, and glad to die. When Dr. Taylor had arrived at Aldham Common, the place where he should suffer, seeing a great multitude of people, he asked, What place is this, and what meaneth it that so much people are gathered hither? It was answered, It is Aldham Common, the place where you must suffer, and the people have come to look upon you. 
Then he said, Thanked be God, I am even at home, and he alighted from his horse and with both hands rent the hood from his head. His head had been notched and clipped like as a man would clip a fool's, which cost the good Bishop Bonner had bestowed upon him. But when the people saw his reverend and ancient face, with a long white beard, they burst out with weeping tears, and cried, saying, God save thee, good Dr. Taylor. Jesus Christ strengthen thee, and help thee. The Holy Ghost comfort thee, with such other like good wishes. When he had prayed, he went to the stake and kissed it, and set himself into a pitch barrel, which they had put for him to stand in, and stood with his back upright against the stake, with his hands folded together, and his eyes towards heaven, and continually prayed. They then bound him with the chains, and having set up the faggots, one Warwick cruelly cast a faggot at him, which struck him on his head, and cut his face, sought hath the blood ran down. Then said Dr. Taylor, O friend, I have harm enough, what needed that? Sir John Shelton standing by, as Dr. Taylor was speaking, and saying the psalm miserere in English, struck him on the lips. You knave, he said, speak Latin, I will make thee. At last they kindled the fire, and Dr. Taylor holding up both his hands, calling upon God, and said, Merciful Father of Heaven! For Jesus Christ, my Saviour's sake, receive my soul into thy hands. So he stood still without either crying or moving, with his hands folded together, until Sois, with a halberd struck him on the head until his brains fell out, and the corpse fell down into the fire. Thus rendered up this man of God his blessed soul into the hands of his merciful Father, and to his most dear Saviour Jesus Christ, whom he most entirely loved, faithfully and earnestly preached, obediently followed in living, and constantly glorified in death. Martyrdom of William Hunter William Hunter had been trained to the doctrines of the Reformation from his earliest youth, being descended from religious parents, who carefully instructed him in the principles of true religion. Hunter, then nineteen years of age, refusing to receive the communion at Mass, was threatened to be brought before the bishop, to whom this valiant young martyr was conducted by a constable. Bonner caused William to be brought into a chamber, where he began to reason with him, promising him security and pardon if he would recant. Nay, he would have been content if he would have gone only to receive and to confession, but William would not do so for all the world. Upon this the bishop commanded his men to put William in the stocks in his gatehouse, where he sat two days and nights, with a crust of brown bread and a cup of water only, which he did not touch. At the two days' end, the bishop came to him, and finding him steadfast in the faith, sent him to the convict prison, and commanded the keeper to lay irons upon him as many as he could bear. He continued in prison three quarters of a year, during which time he had been before the bishop five times, besides the time when he was condemned in the consistory in St. Paul's, February 9th, at which time his brother, Robert Hunter, was present. Then the bishop, calling William, asked him if he would recant, and finding he was unchangeable, pronounced sentence upon him that he should go from that place to Newgate for a time, and thence to Brentwood, there to be burned. About a month afterward, William was sent down to Brentwood, where he was to be executed. On coming to the stake, he knelt down and read the 51st Psalm, until he came to these words, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Steadfast in refusing the queen's pardon, if he would become an apostate, at length one Richard Pond, a bailiff, came, and made the chain fast about him. William now cast his psalter into his brother's hand, who said, William, think on the holy passion of Christ, and be not afraid of death. Behold, answered William, I am not afraid. Then he lifted up his hands to heaven, and said, Lord, 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 receive my spirit, and casting down he head again into the smothering smoke, he yielded up his life for the truth, sealing it with his blood to the praise of God. Dr. Robert Farrar This worthy and learned prelate, the Bishop of St. David's Indiana Wales, having in the former reign, as well as since the accession of Mary, been remarkably zealous in promoting the Reformed doctrines and exploding the roars of popish idolatry, was summoned, among others, before the persecuting Bishop of Winchester and other commissioners set apart for the abominable work of devastation and massacre. His principal accusers and persecutors, on a charge of premunire in the reign of Edward VI, were George Constantine Walter, his servant, Thomas Young, chanter of the cathedral, afterward Bishop of Bangor, etc. Dr. Farrar ably replied to the copies of information laid against him, consisting of 56 articles. The whole process of this trial was long and tedious. 
Delay succeeded delay, and after that Dr. Farrar had been long unjustly detained in custody under sureties in the reign of King Edward, because he had been promoted by the Duke of Somerset, whence after his fall he found fewer friends to support him against such as wanted his bishopric by the coming in of Queen Mary, he was accused and examined not for any matter of premium ire, but for his faith and doctrine, for which he was called before the bishop. Of Winchester with Bishop Hooper, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Bradford, Mr. Saunders, and others, February 4, 1555, on which day he would also with them have been condemned, but his condemnation was deferred, and he sent to prison again, where he continued until February 14, and then was sent into Wales to receive sentence. He was six times brought up before Henry Morgan, Bishop of St. David's, who demanded if he would abjure, from which he zealously dissented, and appealed to Cardinal Pole, notwithstanding which, the bishop, proceeding in his rage, pronounced him a heretic excommunicate, and surrendered him to the secular power. Dr. Farrar, being condemned and degraded, was not long after brought to the place of execution in the town of Carmathon, in the marketplace of which, on the south side of the market cross, March 30, 1555, being Saturday next before Passion Sunday, he most constantly sustained the torments of the fire. Concerning his constancy, it is said that one Richard Jones, a knight's son, coming to Dr. Farrar a little before his death, seemed to lament the painfulness of the death he had to suffer, to whom the bishop answered that if he saw him once stir in the pains of his burning, he might then give no credit to his doctrine, and as he said, so did he maintain his promise, patiently standing without emotion, until one Richard Gravel with a staff struck him. Down. Martyrdom of Rollins White Rollins White was by his calling and occupation a fisherman, living and continuing in the said trade for the space of twenty years at least, in the town of Cardiff, where he bore a very good name amongst his neighbours. Though the good man was altogether unlearned, and withal very simple, yet it pleased God to remove him from error and idolatry to a knowledge of the truth, through the blessed reformation in Edward's reign. He had his son taught to read English, and after the little boy could read pretty well, his father every night after supper, summer and winter, made the boy read a portion of the Holy Scriptures, and now and then a part of some other good book. When he had continued in his profession the space of five years, King Edward died, upon whose decease Queen Mary succeeded and with her all kinds of superstition crept in. White was taken by the officers of the town, as a man suspected of heresy, brought before the Bishop Landaff, and committed to prison in Chepstow, and at last removed to the castle of Cardiff where he continued for the space of one whole year. Being brought before the bishop in his chapel, he counseled him by threats and promises. But as Rollins would in no wise recant his opinions, the bishop told him plainly that he must proceed against him by law, and condemn him as a heretic. Before they proceeded to this extremity, the bishop proposed that prayer should be said for his conversion. This, said White, is like a godly bishop, and if your request be godly and right, and you pray as you ought, no doubt God will hear you, pray you, therefore, to your God, and I will pray to my God. After the bishop and his party had done praying, he asked Rollins if he would now revoke. You find, said the latter, your prayer is not granted, for I remain the same, and God will strengthen me in support of this truth. After this, the bishop tried what saying mass would do, but Rollins called all the people to witness that he did not bow down to the host. Mass being ended, Rollins was called for again, to whom the bishop used many persuasions, but the blessed man continued so steadfast in his former profession that the bishop's discourse was to no purpose. The bishop now caused the definitive sentence to be read, which being ended, Rollins was carried again to Cardiff, to a loathsome prison in the town, called Cockmeral, where he passed his time in prayer, and in the singing of psalms. In about three weeks the order came from town for his execution. When he came to the place, where his poor wife and children stood weeping, the sudden sight of them so pierced his heart, that the tears trickled down his face. Being come to the altar of his sacrifice, in going toward the stake, he fell down upon his knees, and kissed the ground, and in rising again, a little earth sticking on his face, he said these words. Earth unto earth, and dust unto dust, thou art my mother, and unto thee I shall return. When all things were ready, directly over against the stake, in the face of Rollins White, there was a stand erected, whereon stepped up a priest, addressing himself to the people, but, as he spoke of the Romish doctrines of the sacraments, Rollins cried out, Ah! Thou wicked hypocrite, dost thou presume to prove thy false doctrine by scripture? Look in the text that followeth, did not Christ say, Do this in remembrance of me? Then some that stood by cried out, Put fire! Set on fire, which being done, the straw and reeds cast up a great and sudden flame. 
in which flame this good man bathed his hands so long, until such time as the sinews shrank, and the fat dropped away, saving that once he did, as it were, wipe his face with one of them. All this while, which was somewhat long, he cried with a loud voice, O Lord, receive my spirit, until he could not open his mouth. At last the extremity of the fire was so vehement against his legs that they were consumed almost before the rest of his body was hurt, which made the whole body fall over the chains into the fire sooner than it would have done. Thus died this good old man for his testimony of God's truth, and is now rewarded, no doubt, with the crown of eternal life. The Reverend George Marsh George Marsh, born in the parish of Dean in the county of Lancaster, received a good education in trade from his parents, about his twenty-fifth year he married, and lived, blessed with several children, on his farm until his wife died. He then went to study at Cambridge, and became the curate of Reverend Lawrence Saunders, in which duty he constantly and zealously set forth the truth of God's word, and the false doctrines of the modern Antichrist. Being confined by Dr. Coles, the Bishop of Chester, within the precincts of his own house, he was department from any intercourse with his friends during four months, his friends and mother, earnestly wished him to have flown from the wrath to come, but Mr. Marsh thought that such a step would ill agree with that profession he had during nine years openly made. He, however, secreted himself, but he had much struggling, and in secret prayer begged that God would direct him, through the advice of his best friends, for his own glory and to what was best. At length, determined by a letter he received, boldly to confess the faith of Christ, he took leave of his mother-in-law and other friends, recommending his children to their care and departed for Smethills, whence he was, with others, conducted to Latham, to undergo examination before the Earl of Derby, Sir William Knowers, Mr. Sherburne, the parson of Garknell, and others. The various questions put to him he answered with a good conscience, but when Mr. Sherburne interrogated him upon his belief of the sacrament of the altar, Mr. Marsh answered like a true Protestant that the essence of the bread and wine was not at all changed, hence, after receiving dreadful threats from some, and fair words from others, for his opinions, he was remanded to ward, where he lay two nights without any bed. On Palm Sunday he underwent a second examination, and Mr. Marsh much lamented that his fear should at all have induced him to prevaricate, and to seek his safety, as long as he did not openly deny Christ, and he again cried more earnestly to God for strength that he might not be overcome by the subtleties of those who strove to overrule the purity of his faith. He underwent three examinations before Dr. Coles, who, finding him steadfast in the Protestant faith, began to read his sentence, but he was interrupted by the Chancellor, who prayed the bishop to stay before it was too late. The priest then prayed for Mr. Marsh, but the latter, upon being again solicited to recant, said he durst not deny his Saviour Christ, lest he lose his everlasting mercy, and so obtain eternal death. The bishop then proceeded in the sentence. He was committed to a dark dungeon, and lay deprived of the consolation of anyone, for all were afraid to relieve or communicate with him, until the day appointed came that he should suffer. The sheriffs of the city, Amory and Coor, with their officers, went to the north gate, and took out Mr. George Marsh, who walked all the way with the book in his hand, looking upon the same, whence the people said, This man does not go to his death as a thief, nor as one that deserveth to die. When he came to the place of execution without the city, near Spittle equals Boughton, Mr. Caudry, deputy chamberlain of Chester, showed Mr. Marsh a writing under a great seal, saying that it was a pardon for him if he would recant. He answered that he would gladly accept the same did it not tend to pluck him from God. After that, he began to speak to the people showing the cause of his death, and would have exhorted them to stick unto Christ, but one of the sheriffs prevented him. Kneeling down, he then said his prayers, put off his clothes unto his shirt, and was chained to the post, having a number of faggots under him, and a thing made like a firkin, with pitch and tar in it, over his head. The fire being unskillfully made, and the wind driving it in eddies, he suffered great extremity, which notwithstanding he bore with Christian fortitude. When he had been a long time tormented in the fire without moving, having his flesh so broiled and puffed up that they who stood before him could not see the chain wherewith he was fastened, and therefore supposed that he had been dead, suddenly he spread abroad his arms, saying, Father of heaven have mercy upon me, and so yielded his spirit into the hands of the Lord. Upon this, many of the people said he was a martyr, and died gloriously patient. This caused the bishop shortly after to make a sermon in the cathedral church, and therein he affirmed, that the said Marsh was a heretic, burnt as such, and is a firebrand in hell. Mr. Marsh suffered April 24, 1555. William Flower 
William Flower, otherwise Branch, was born at Snow Hill, in the county of Cambridge, where he went to school some years, and then came to the Abbey of Ely. After he had remained a while he became a professed monk, was made a priest in the same house, and there celebrated and sang Massachusetts. After that, by reason of a visitation, and certain injunctions by the authority of Henry VIII he took upon him the habit of a secular priest, and returned to Snow Hill, where he was born, and taught children about half a year. He then went to Ludgate, in Suffolk, and served as a secular priest about a quarter of a year, from thence to Stoneland, at length to Tewkesbury, where he married a wife, with whom he ever after faithfully and honestly continued. After marriage he resided at Tewkesbury about two years, and thence went to Brosley, where he practiced physic and surgery, but departing from those parts he came to London, and finally settled at Lambeth, where he and his wife dwelt together. However, he was generally abroad, excepting once or twice in a month, to visit and see his wife. Being at home upon Easter Sunday morning, he came over the water from Lambeth into a stay. Margaret's church at Westminster, when seeing a priest, named John Seltham, administering and giving the sacrament of the altar to the people, and being greatly offended in his conscience with the priest for the same, he struck and wounded him upon the head, and also upon the arm and hand, with his wood knife, the priest having at the same time in his hand a chalice with the consecrated host therein, which became sprinkled with blood. Mr. Flower, for this injudicious zeal, was heavily ironed, and put into the gatehouse at Westminster, and afterwards summoned before Bishop Bonner and his ordinary, where the bishop, after he had sworn him upon a book, ministered articles and interrogatories to him. After examination, the bishop began to exhort him again to return to the unity of his mother, the Catholic Church, with many fair promises. These Mr. Flower steadfastly rejecting, the bishop ordered him to appear in the same place in the afternoon, and in the meantime to consider well his former answer, but he, neither apologizing for having struck the priest, nor swerving from his faith, the bishop assigned him the next day, April 20th, to receive sentence if he would not recant. The next morning, the bishop accordingly proceeded to the sentence, condemning and excommunicating him for a heretic, and after pronouncing him to be degraded, committed him to the secular power. On April 24, St. Mark's Eve, he was brought to the place of martyrdom in St. Margaret's Churchyard, Westminster, where the fact was committed, and there coming to the stake, he prayed to Almighty God, made a confession of his faith, and forgave all the world. This done, his hand was held up against the stake, and struck off, his left hand being fastened behind him. Fire was then set to him, and he burning therein, cried with a loud voice, O thou Son of God receive my soul, three times. His speech being now taken from him, he spoke no more, but notwithstanding he lifted up the stump with his other arm as long as he could. Thus he endured the extremity of the fire, and was cruelly tortured, for the few faggots that were brought being insufficient to burn him they were compelled to strike him down into the fire, where lying along upon the ground, his lower part was consumed in the fire, whilst his upper part was little injured, his tongue moving in his mouth for a considerable time. The Reverend John Cardmaker and John Warren May 30, 1555, the Reverend John Cardmaker, otherwise called Taylor, prebendary of the Church of Wells, and John Warren, upholsterer, of St. John's, Walbrook, suffered together in Smithfield. Mr. Cardmaker, who first was an observant friar before the dissolution of the abbeys, afterward was a married minister, and in King Edward's time appointed to be a reader in St. Paul's, being apprehended in the beginning of Queen Mary's reign, with Dr. Barlow, Bishop of Bath, he was brought to London, and put in the fleet prison, King Edward's laws being yet in force. In Mary's reign, when brought before the Bishop of Winchester, the latter offered them the Queen's mercy, if they would recant. Articles having been preferred against Mr. John Warren, he was examined upon them by Bonner, who earnestly exhorted him to recant his opinions, to whom he answered, I am persuaded that I am in the right opinion, and I see no cause to recant, for all the filthiness and idolatry lies in the Church of Rome. The bishop then, seeing that all his fair promises and terrible threatenings could not prevail, pronounced the definitive sentence of condemnation, and ordered May 30, 1555, for the execution of John Cardmaker and John Warren, who were brought by the sheriffs to Smithfield. Being come to the stake, the sheriffs called Mr. Cardmaker aside, and talked with him secretly, during which Mr. Warren prayed, was chained to the stake, and had wood and reeds set about him. The people were greatly afflicted thinking that Mr. Cardmaker would recant at the burning of Mr. Warren. At length Mr. Cardmaker departed from the sheriffs, and came towards the stake, knelt down, and made a long prayer in silence to himself. He then rose up, 
put off his clothes to his shirt, and went with a bold courage unto the stake and kissed it, and taking Mr. Warren by the hand, he heartily comforted him, and was bound to the stake, rejoicing. The people seeing this so suddenly done, contrary to their previous expectation, cried out, God be praised. The Lord strengthen thee, cardmaker. The Lord Jesus receive thy spirit. And this continued while the executioner put fire to them, and both had passed through the fire to the blessed rest and peace among God's holy saints and martyrs, to enjoy the crown of triumph and victory prepared for the elect soldiers and warriors of Christ Jesus in his blessed kingdom, to whom be glory and majesty forever. Amen. John Simpson and John Ardley John Simpson and John Ardley were condemned on the same day with Mr. Carmaker and John Warren, which was the 25th of May. They were shortly after sent down from London to Essex, where they were burnt in one day, John Simpson at Rockford, and John Ardley at Rayleigh, glorifying God in his beloved son, and rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer. Thomas Haukes, Thomas Watts, and in Askew Thomas Haukes, with six others, was condemned on the 9th of February, 1555. In education he was erudite, in person, comely, and of good stature, in manners, a gentleman, and a sincere Christian. A little before death, several of Mr. Hawke's friends, terrified by the sharpness of the punishment he was going to suffer, privately desired that in the midst of the flames he should show them some token, whether the pains of burning were so great that a man might not collectively endure it. This he promised to do, and it was agreed that if the rage of the pain might be suffered, then he should lift up his hands above his head towards heaven, before he gave up the ghost. Not long after, Mr. Haukes was led away to the place appointed for slaughter by Lord Rich, and being come to the stake, mildly and patiently prepared himself for the fire, having a strong chain cast about his middle, with a multitude of people on every side compassing him about, unto whom after he had spoken many things, and poured out his soul unto God, the fire was kindled. When he had continued long in it, and his speech was taken away by violence of the flame, his skin drawn together, and his fingers consumed with the fire, so that it was thought that he was gone, suddenly and contrary to all expectation, this good man being mindful of his promise, reached up his hands burning in flames over his head to the living God, and with great rejoicings as it seemed, struck or clapped them three times together. A great shout followed this wonderful circumstance, and then this blessed martyr of Christ, sinking down in the fire, gave up his spirit, June 10, 1555. Thomas Watts, a Bilricka, in Essex, of the Diocese of London, was a linen draper. He had daily expected to be taken by God's adversaries, and this came to pass on the 5th of April, 1555, when he was brought before Lord Rich and other commissioners at Chelmsford, and accused for not coming to the church. Being consigned over to the bloody bishop, who gave him several hearings, and, as usual, many arguments, with much entreaty, that he would be a disciple of Antichrist, but his preaching availed not, and he resorted to his last revenge that of condemnation. At the stake, after he had kissed it, he spake to Lord Rich, charging him to repent, for the Lord would revenge his death. Thus did this good martyr offer his body to the fire, in defense of the true gospel of the Savior. Thomas Osmond, William Bamford, and Nicholas Chamberlain, all of the town of Coxall, being sent up to be examined, Bonner, after several hearings, pronounced them obstinate heretics, and delivered them to the sheriffs, in whose custody they remained until they were delivered to the sheriff of Essex County, and by him were executed, Chamberlain at Colchester, the 14th of June, Thomas Osmond at Manningtree, and William Bamford, alias Butler, at Harwich, the 15th of June, 1555, all dying full of the glorious hope of immortality. Then Ryathesley, Lord Chancellor, offered and asked you the king's pardon if she would recant, who made this answer, that she came not thither to deny her lord and master. And thus the good and asked you, being compassed in with flames of fire, as a blessed sacrifice unto God, slept in the Lord, A.D. 1546, leaving behind her a singular example of Christian constancy for all men to follow. Reverend John Bradford, and John Leaf, an apprentice. Reverend John Bradford was born at Manchester, in Lancashire, he was a good Latin scholar, and afterward became a servant of Sir John Harrington, Knight. He continued several years in an honest and thriving way, but the Lord had elected him to a better function. Hence he departed from his master, quitting the temple, at London, for the University of Cambridge, to learn, by God's law, how to further the building of the Lord's temple. In a few years after, the university gave him the degree of Master of Arts, and he became a fellow of Pembroke Hall. 
Martin Bucer first urged him to preach, and when he modestly doubted his ability, Bucer was wont to reply, If thou hast not fine wheat bread, yet give the poor people barley bread, or whatsoever else the Lord hath committed unto thee. Dr. Ridley, that worthy Bishop of London, and glorious martyr of Christ, first called him to take the degree of a deacon and gave him a prebend in his cathedral church of St. Paul. In this preaching office Mr. Bradford diligently labored for the space of three years. Sharply he reproved sin, sweetly he preached Christ crucified, ably he disproved heresies and errors, earnestly he persuaded to godly life. After the death of blessed King Edward VI Mr. Bradford still continued diligent in preaching, until he was suppressed by Queen Mary. An act now followed of the blackest ingratitude, and at which a pagan would blush. It has been recited, that a tumult was occasioned by Mr. Bournes, then Bishop of Bath, preaching at St. Paul's Cross, the indignation of the people placed his life in imminent danger, indeed a dagger was thrown at him. In this situation he entreated Mr. Bradford, who stood behind him, to speak in his place, and assuage the tumult. The people welcomed Mr. Bradford, and the latter afterward kept close to him, that his presence might prevent the populace from renewing their assaults. The same Sunday in the afternoon, Mr. Bradford preached at Bow Church in Cheapside, and reproved the people sharply for their seditious misdemeanor. Notwithstanding this conduct, within three days after, he was sent for to the Tower of London, where the Queen then was, to appear before the council. There he was charged with this act of saving Mr. Bourne, which was called seditious, and they also objected against him for preaching. Thus he was committed, first to the Tower, then to other prisons, and, after his condemnation, to the poultry counter, where he preached twice a day continually, unless sickness hindered him. Such is his credit with the keeper of the king's bench, that he permitted him in an evening to visit a poor, sick person near the steelyard, upon his promise to return in time, and in this he never failed. The night before he was sent to Newgate, he was troubled in his sleep by foreboding dreams, that on Monday after he should be burned in Smithfield. In the afternoon the keeper's wife came up and announced this dreadful news to him, but in him it excited only thankfulness to God. At night half a dozen friends came, with whom he spent all the evening in prayer and godly exercises. When he was removed to Newgate, a weeping crowd accompanied him, and a rumor having been spread that he was to suffer it for the next morning, an immense multitude attended. At nine o'clock Mr. Bradford was brought into Smithfield. The cruelty of the sheriff deserves notice, for his brother-in-law, Roger Beswick, having taken him by the hand as he passed, Mr. Woodroff, with his staff, cut his head open. Mr. Bradford, being come to the place, fell flat on the ground, and putting off his clothes unto the shirt, he went to the stake, and there suffered with a young man of twenty years of age, whose name was John Leaf, an apprentice to Mr. Humphrey Gotti, Tallow Chandler, of Christchurch, London. Upon Friday before Palm Sunday, he was committed to the Compter in Bread Street, and afterward examined and condemned by the bloody bishop. It is reported of him, that, when the bill of his confession was read unto him, instead of pen, he took a pin, and pricking his hand, sprinkled the blood upon the said bill, desiring the reader thereof to show the bishop that he had sealed the same bill with his blood already. They both ended this mortal life, July 12, 1555, like two lambs, without any alteration of their countenances, hoping to obtain that prize they had long run for, to which may Almighty God conduct us all, through the merits of Christ our Saviour. We shall conclude this article with mentioning that Mr. Sheriff Woodroffe, it is said, within half a year after, was struck on the right side with a palsy, and for the space of eight years after, until his dying day, he was unable to turn himself in his bed, thus he became at last a fearful object to behold. The day after Mr. Bradford and John Leaf suffered in Smithfield William Minge, priest, died in prison at Maidstone. With as great constancy and boldness he yielded up his life in prison, as if it had pleased God to have called him to suffer by fire, as other godly men had done before at the stake, and as he himself was ready to do, had it pleased God to have called him to this trial. Rev. John Bland, Rev. John Franksh, Nicholas Shetterton, and Humphrey Middleton. These Christian persons were all burnt at Canterbury for the same cause. Franksh and Bland were ministers and preachers of the Word of God, the one being parson of Adesham, and the other vicar of Rolvenden. Mr. Bland was cited to answer for his opposition to anti-Christianism, and underwent several examinations before Dr. Harpsfield, Archdeacon of Canterbury, and finally on the 25th of June, 1555, again withstanding the power of the Pope, he was condemned, and delivered to the secular arm.
On the same day were condemned John Franks, Nicholas Shetterden, Humphrey Middleton, Thacker, and Crocker, of whom Thacker only recanted. Being delivered to the secular power, Mr. Bland, with the three former, were all burnt together at Canterbury, July 12, 1555, at two several stakes, but in one fire, when they, in the sight of God and his angels, and before men, like true soldiers of Jesus Christ, gave a constant testimony to the truth of this holy gospel. Derek Carver and John Launder The 22nd of July, 1555, Derek Carver, brewer, of Bright Helmstone, aged 40, was burnt at Lewis. And the day following John Launder, husbandman, aged 25, of Godstone, Surrey, was burnt at Stenning. Derek Carver was a man whom the Lord had blessed as well with temporal riches as with his spiritual treasures. At his coming into the town of Lewis to be burnt, the people called to him, beseeching God to strengthen him in the faith of Jesus Christ, and, as he came to the stake, he knelt down and prayed earnestly. Then his book was thrown into the barrel, and when he had stripped himself, he too went into a barrel. As soon as he was in, he took the book and threw it among the people, upon which the sheriff commanded, in the name of the king and queen, on pain of death, to throw in the book again. And immediately the holy martyr began to address the people. After he had prayed a while, he said, O Lord my God, thou hast written, He that will not forsake wife, children, house, and everything that he hath, and take up thy cross and follow thee, is not worthy of thee. But thou, Lord, knowest that I have forsaken all that come unto thee. Lord, have mercy upon me, for unto thee I commend my spirit. And my soul doth rejoice in thee. These were the last words of this faithful servant of Christ before enduring the fire. And when the fire came to him, he cried, O Lord, have mercy upon me, and sprang up in the fire, calling upon the name of Jesus, until he gave up the ghost. James obeys. This young man wandered about to escape apprehension, but was at last informed against and brought before the Bishop of Norwich, who influenced him to recant, to secure him further in apostasy, the Bishop afterward gave him a piece of money, but the interference of Providence is here remarkable. This bribe lay so heavily upon his conscience, that he returned, threw back the money, and repented of his conduct. Like Peter, he was contrite, steadfast in the faith, and sealed it with his blood at Barry, August 2, 1555, praising and glorifying God. John Denley, John Newman, and Patrick Packingham Mr. Denley and Newman were returning one day to Maidstone, the place of their abode, when they were met by E. Tyrell, E. S. Q., a bigoted justice of the peace in Essex, and a cruel persecutor of the Protestants. He apprehended them merely on suspicion. On the 5th of July, 1555, they were condemned and consigned to the sheriffs who sent Mr. Denley to Uxbridge, where he perished, August 8, 1555. While suffering in agony and singing his psalm, Dr. Story inhumanly ordered one of the tormentors to throw a faggot at him, which cut his face severely, caused him to see singing, and to raise his hands to his face. Just as Dr. Story was remarking in jest that he had spoiled a good song, the pious martyr again changed, spread his hands abroad in the flames, and through Christ Jesus resigned his soul into the hands of his Maker. Mr. Packingham suffered at the same town on the 29th of the same month. Mr. Newman, pewterer, was burnt at Saffron Walden, in Essex, August 31st, for the same cause, and Richard Hook about the same time perished at Chichester. W. Coker, W. Cooper, H. Lawrence, R. Collier, R. Wright and W. Steer. These persons all of Kent were examined at the same time with Mr. Bland and Shetterden, by Thornton, Bishop of Dover, Dr. Harpsfield, and others. These six martyrs and witnesses of the truth were consigned to the flames in Canterbury, at the end of August, 1555. Elizabeth Warren, widow of John Warren, upholsterer, martyr, was burnt at Stratford Lubau, near London, at the end of August, 1555. George Tankerfield, of London, Cook, born at York, aged 27, in the reign of Edward VI had been a papist, but the cruelty of Bloody Mary made him suspect the truth of those doctrines which were enforced by fire and torture. Tankerfield was imprisoned in Newgate about the end of February, 1555, and on August 26, at St. Albans, he braved the excruciating fire, and joyfully died for the glory of his Redeemer. Rev. Robert Smith was first in the service of Sir Tia Smith, Provost of Eton, and was afterward removed to Windsor, where he had a clerkship of £10 a year. He was condemned, July 12, 1555, and suffered August 8, at Uxbridge.
He doubted not but that God would give the spectators some token in support of his own cause, this actually happened, for, when he was nearly half burnt, and supposed to be dead, he suddenly rose up, moved the remaining parts of his arms and praised God, then, hanging over the fire, he sweetly slept in the Lord Jesus. Mr. Stephen Harwood and Mr. Thomas Fust suffered about the same time with Smith and Tankerfield, with whom they were condemned. Mr. William Hale also, of Thorpe, in Essex, was sent to Barnet, or about the same time he joined the ever-blessed company of martyrs. George King, Thomas Laius, and John Wade, falling sick in Lalit's Tower, were removed to different houses, and died. Their bodies were thrown out in the common fields as unworthy of burial, and lay until the faithful conveyed them away at night. Mr. William Andrew of Horsley, Essex, was imprisoned in Newgate for heresy, but God chose to call him to himself by the severe treatment he endured in Newgate, and thus to mock the snagwinary expectations of his Catholic persecutors. His body was thrown into the open air, but his soul was received into the everlasting mansions of his heavenly Creator. The Reverend Robert Samuel this gentleman was minister off of Bradford, Suffolk, where he industriously taught the flock committed to his charge, while he was openly permitted to discharge his duty. He was first persecuted by Mr. Foster, of Copdock, near Ipswich, a severe and bigoted persecutor of the followers of Christ, according to the truth in the gospel. Notwithstanding Mr. Samuel was ejected from his living, he continued to exhort and instruct privately, nor would he obey the order for putting away his wife, whom he had married in King Edward's reign but kept her at Ipswich, where Foster, by warrant, surprised him by night with her. After being imprisoned in Ipswich jail, he was taken before Dr. Hopton, Bishop of Norwich, and Dr. Dunnings, his Chancellor, two of the most sanguinary among the bigots of those days. To intimidate the worthy pastor, he was in prison chained to a post in such a manner that the weight of his body was supported by the points of his toes, added to this his allowance of provision was reduced to a quantity so insufficient to sustain nature that he was almost ready to devour his own flesh. From this dreadful extremity there was even a degree of mercy in ordering him to the fire. Mr. Samuel suffered August 31, 1555. Bishop Ridley and Bishop Latimer these reverend prelates suffered October 17, 5555, at Oxford, on the same day Wolsey and Pygott perished at Ely. Pillars of the church and accomplished ornaments of human nature, they were the admiration of the realm, amiably conspicuous in their lives, and glorious in their deaths. Dr. Ridley was born in Northumberland, was first taught grammar at Newcastle, and afterward removed to Cambridge, where his aptitude in education raised him gradually until he came to be the head of Pembroke College where he received the title of Doctor of Divinity. Having returned from a trip to Paris, he was appointed chaplain by Henry VIII and Bishop of Rochester, and was afterwards translated to the See of London in the time of Edward VI. To his sermons the people resorted, swarming about him like bees, coveting the sweet flowers and wholesome juice of the fruitful doctrine, which he did not only preach, but showed the same by his life, as a glittering lantern to the eyes and senses of the blind, in such pure order that his very enemies could not reprove him in any one jot. His tender treatment of Dr. Heath, who was a prisoner with him during one year, in Edward's reign, evidently proves that he had no Catholic cruelty in his disposition. In person he was erect and well-proportioned, in temper forgiving, in self-mortification severe. His first duty in the morning was private prayer, he remained in his study until ten o'clock, and then attended the daily prayer used in his house. Dinner being done, he sat about an hour, conversing pleasantly, or playing at chess. His study next engaged his attention, unless business or visits occurred, about five o'clock prayers followed, and after he would recreate himself at chess for about an hour, then retire to his study until eleven o'clock, and pray on his knees as in the morning. In brief, he was a pattern of godliness and virtue, and such he endeavored to make men wherever he came. His attentive kindness was displayed particularly to old Mrs. Bonner, mother of Dr. Bonner, the cruel Bishop of London. Dr. Ridley, when at his manor at Fulham, always invited her to his house, placed her at the head of his table, and treated her like his own mother, he did the same by Bonner's sister and other relatives, but when Dr. Ridley was under persecution, Bonner pursued a conduct diametrically opposite, and would have sacrificed Dr. Ridley's sister and her husband, Mr. George Shipside, had not Providence delivered him by the means of Dr. Heath, Bishop of Worcester. Dr. Ridley was first in part converted by reading Bertram's book on the sacrament, 
and by his conferences with Archbishop Cranmer and Peter Martyr. When Edward VI was removed from the throne, and the Bloody Mary succeeded, Bishop Ridley was immediately marked as an object of slaughter. He was first sent to the Tower, and afterward, at Oxford, was consigned to the common prison of Bocardo, with Archbishop Cranmer and Mr. Latimer. Being separated from them, he was placed in the house of one Irish, where he remained until the day of his martyrdom, from 1554, until October 16, 1555. It will easily be supposed that the conversations of these chiefs of the martyrs were elaborate, learned, and instructive. Such indeed they were, and equally beneficial to all their spiritual comforts. Bishop Ridley's letters to various Christian brethren in bonds in all parts, and his disputations with the mitred enemies of Christ, alike proved the clearness of his head and the integrity of his heart. In a letter to Mr. Grindel, afterward Archbishop of Canterbury, he mentions with affection those who had preceded him in dying for the faith, and those who were expected to suffer, he regrets that popery is re-established in its full abomination, which he attributes to the wrath of God, made manifest in return for the lukewarmness of the clergy and the people in justly appreciating the blessed light of the Reformation. This old practice soldier of Christ, Master Hugh Latimer, was the son of one Hugh Latimer, of Thurkesson in the county of Leicester, a husbandman, of a good and wealthy estimation, where also he was born and brought up until he was four years of age, or thereabout, at which time his parents, having him as then left for their only son, with six daughters, seeing his ready, prompt, and sharp wit, purposed to train him up in erudition, and knowledge of good literature, wherein he so profited in his youth at the common schools of his own country, that at the age of fourteen years, he was sent to the University of Cambridge, where he entered into the study of the school divinity of that day, and was from principle a zealous observer of the Romish superstitions of the time. In his oration when he commenced Bachelor of Divinity, he inveighed against the reformer Melanchthon, and openly declaimed against good Mr. Stafford, divinity lecturer in Cambridge. Mr. Thomas Bilney, moved by a brotherly pity towards Mr. Latimer, begged to wait upon him in his study, and to explain to him the groundwork of his, Mr. Bilney's, faith. This blessed interview effected his conversion, the persecutor of Christ became his zealous advocate, and before Dr. Stafford died he became reconciled to him. Once converted, he became eager for the conversion of others, and commenced to be public preacher and private instructor in the university. His sermons were so pointed against the absurdity of praying in the Latin tongue and withholding the oracles of salvation from the people who were to be saved by belief in them, that he drew upon himself the pulpit animadversions of several of the resident friars and heads of houses, whom he subsequently silenced by his severe criticisms and eloquent arguments. This was at Christmas, 1529. At length Drive West preached against Mr. Latimer at Barwell Abbey, and prohibited him from preaching again in the churches of the university, notwithstanding which, he continued during three years to advocate openly the cause of Christ, and even his enemies confessed the power of those talents he possessed. Mr. Bilney remained here some time with Mr. Latimer, and thus the place where they frequently walked together obtained the name of Heretic's Hill. Mr. Latimer at this time traced out the innocence of a poor woman, accused by her husband of the murder of her child. Having preached before King Henry VIII at Windsor, he obtained the unfortunate mother's pardon. This, with many other benevolent acts, served only to excite the spleen of his adversaries. He was summoned before Cardinal Wolsey for heresy, but being a strenuous supporter of the king's supremacy, in opposition to the Pope's, by favor of Lord Cromwell and Dr. Butts, the king's physician, he obtained the living of West Kingston, in Wiltshire. For his sermons here against purgatory, the immaculacy of the Virgin, and the worship of images, he was cited to appear before Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, and John, Bishop of London. He was required to subscribe certain articles, expressive of his conformity to the accustomed usages, and there is reason to think, after repeated weekly examinations, that he did subscribe, as they did not seem to involve any important article of belief. Guided by providence, he escaped the subtle nets of his persecutors, and at length, through the powerful friends before mentioned, became Bishop of Worcester, in which function he qualified or explained away most of the papal ceremonies he was for form's sake under the necessity of complying with. He continued in this active and dignified employment some years. Beginning afresh to set forth his plough he labored in the Lord's harvest most fruitfully, discharging his talent as well in divers places of this realm, as before the king at the court. 
In the same place of the inward garden, which was before applied to lascivious and courtly pastimes, there he dispensed the fruitful word of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching there before the king and his whole court, to the edification of many. He remained a prisoner in the tower until the coronation of Edward VI, when he was again called to the Lord's Harvest in Stamford, and many other places, he also preached at London in the Convocation House, and before the young king, indeed he lectured twice every Sunday, regardless of his great age, then above sixty-seven years, and his weakness through a bruise received from the fall of a tree. Indefatigable in his private studies, he rose to them in winter and in summer at two o'clock in the morning. By the strength of his own mind, or of some inward light from above, he had a prophetic view of what was to happen to the church in Mary's reign, asserting that he was doomed to suffer for the truth, and that Winchester, then in the tower, was preserved for that purpose. Soon after Queen Mary was proclaimed, a messenger was sent to summon Mr. Latimer to town, and there is reason to believe it was wished that he should make his escape. Thus Master Latimer coming up to London, through Smithfield, where merrily he said that Smithfield had long grown for him, was brought before the council, where he patiently bore all the mocks and taunts given him by the scornful papists. He was cast into the tower, where he, being assisted with the heavenly grace of Christ, sustained imprisonment a long time, notwithstanding the cruel and unmerciful handling of the lordly papists, which thought then their kingdom would never fall, he showed himself not only patient, but also cheerful in and above all that which they could or would work against him. Yeah, such a valiant spirit the Lord gave him, that he was able not only to despise the terribleness of prisons and torments, but also to laugh to scorn the doings of his enemies. Mr. Latimer, after remaining a long time in the tower, was transported to Oxford, with Cranmer and Ridley, the disputations at which place have been already mentioned in a former part of this work. He remained imprisoned until October, and the principal objects of all his prayers were three that he might stand faithful to the doctrine he had professed, that God would restore his gospel to England once again, and preserve the Lady Elizabeth to be queen, all of which happened. When he stood at the stake without the Bocardo Gate, Oxford, with Dr. Ridley, and fire was put into the pile of faggots, he raised his eyes benignantly towards heaven, and said, God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. His body was forcibly penetrated by the fire, and the blood flowed abundantly from the heart, as if to verify his constant desire that his heart's blood might be shed in defense of the gospel. His polemical and friendly letters are lasting monuments of his integrity and talents. It has been before said that public disputation took place in April, 1554, new examinations took place in October, 1555, previous to the degradation and condemnation of Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer. We now draw to the conclusion of the lives of the two last. Dr. Ridley, the night before execution, was very facetious, had himself shaved, and called his supper a marriage feast, he remarked upon seeing Mrs. Irish, the keeper's wife, weep, though my breakfast will be somewhat sharp, my supper will be more pleasant and sweet. The place of death was on the north side of the town, opposite Balliol College. Dr. Ridley was dressed in a black gown furred, and Mr. Latimer had a long shroud on, hanging down to his feet. Dr. Ridley, as he passed Bocardo, looked up to see Dr. Cranmer, but the latter was then engaged in disputation with a friar. When they came to the stake, Mr. Ridley embraced Latimer fervently, and bid him, Be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flame, or else strengthen us to abide it. He then knelt by the stake, and after earnestly praying together, they had a short private conversation. Dr. Smith then preached a short sermon against the martyrs, who would have answered him, but were prevented by Dr. Marshall, the vice-chancellor. Dr. Ridley then took off his gown and tippet and gave them to his brother-in-law, Mr. Shipside. He gave away also many trifles to his weeping friends, and the populace were anxious to get even a fragment of his garments. Mr. Latimer gave nothing, and from the poverty of his garb, was soon stripped to his shroud, and stood venerable and erect, fearless of death. Dr. Ridley being unclothed to his shirt, the smith placed an iron chain about their waists, and Dr. Ridley bid him fasten it securely, his brother having tied a bag of gunpowder about his neck, gave some also to Mr. Latimer. Dr. Ridley then requested of Lord Williams, of fame, to advocate with the Queen the cause of some poor men to whom he had, when Bishop, granted leases, but which the present Bishop refused to confirm. A lighted faggot was now laid at Dr. Ridley's feet, which caused Mr. Latimer to say, Be of good cheer, Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, 
by God's grace, light up such a candle in England, as I trust, will never be put out. When Dr. Ridley saw the fire flaming up towards him, he cried with a wonderful loud voice, Lord, Lord, receive my spirit. Master Latimer, crying as vehemently on the other side, O Father of heaven, receive my soul, receive the flame as it were embracing of it. After that he had stroked his face with his hands, and as it were, bathed them a little in the fire, he soon died, as it appeareth, with very little pain or none. Well! Dead they are, and the reward of this world they have already. What reward remaineth for them in heaven, the day of the Lord's glory, when he cometh with his saints, shall declare. In the following month died Stephen Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor of England. This papistical monster was born at Bury, in Suffolk, and partly educated at Cambridge. Ambitious, cruel, and bigoted, he served any cause, he first espoused the king's part in the affair of Anbolan, upon the establishment of the Reformation he declared the supremacy of the Pope an execrable tenet, and when Queen Mary came to the crown, he entered into all her papistical bigoted views, and became a second time Bishop of Winchester. It is conjectured it was his intention to have moved the sacrifice of Lady Elizabeth, but when he arrived at this point, it pleased God to remove him. It was on the afternoon of the day when those faithful soldiers of Christ, Ridley and Latimer, perished, that Gardiner sat down with a joyful heart to dinner. Scarcely had he taken a few mouthfuls when he was seized with illness and carried to his bed, where he lingered fifteen days in great torment, unable in any wise to evacuate, and burnt with a devouring fever that terminated in death. Execrated by all good Christians, we pray the Father of mercies, that he may receive that mercy above he never imparted below. Mr. John Philpot. This martyr was the son of a knight, born in Hampshire, and brought up at New College, Oxford, where for several years he studied the civil law, and became eminent in the Hebrew tongue. He was a scholar and a gentleman, zealous in religion, fearless in disposition, and a detester of flattery. After visiting Italy, he returned to England, affairs in King Edward's days wearing a more promising aspect. During this reign he continued to be Archdeacon of Winchester under Dr. Poynet, who succeeded Gardiner. Upon the accession of Mary, a convocation was summoned, in which Mr. Philpot defended the Reformation against his ordinary, Gardiner, again made Bishop of Winchester, and soon was conducted to Bonner and other commissioners for examination, October 2, 1555, after being 18 months imprisoned. Upon his demanding to see the commission, Dr. Story cruelly observed, I will spend both my gown and my coat, but I will burn thee. Let him be in Lalit's tower, a wretched prison, for I will sweep the king's bench and all other prisons of these heretics. Upon Mr. Philpot's second examination, it was intimated to him that Dr. Story had said that the Lord Chancellor had commanded that he should be made away with. It is easy to foretell the result of this inquiry. He was committed to Bonner's coal house, where he joined company with a zealous minister of Essex, who had been induced to sign a bill of recantation, but afterward, stung by his conscience, he asked the bishop to let him see the instrument again, when he tore it to pieces, which induced Bonner in a fury to strike him repeatedly and tear away part of his beard. Mr. Philpot had a private interview with Bonner the same night, and was then remanded to his bed of straw like other prisoners in the coal house. After seven examinations, Bonner ordered him to be set in the stocks, and on the following Sunday separated him from his fellow prisoners as a sower of heresy, and ordered him up to a room near the battlements of St. Paul's, eight feet by thirteen, on the other side of Lollet's Tower, and which could be overlooked by anyone in the bishop's outer gallery. Here Mr. Philpot was searched, but happily he was successful in secreting some letters containing his examinations. In the eleventh investigation before various bishops and Mr. Morgan of Oxford, the latter was so driven into a corner by the close pressure of Mr. Philpot's arguments, that he said to him, Instead of the spirit of the gospel which you boast to possess, I think it is the spirit of the buttery, which your fellows have had, who were drunk before their death, and went, I believe, drunk into it. To this unfounded and brutish remark, Mr. Philpot indignantly replied, It appeareth by your communication that you are better acquainted with that spirit than the spirit of God, wherefore I tell thee, thou painted wall and hypocrite, in the name of the living God, whose truth I have told thee, that God shall rain fire and brimstone upon such blasphemers as thou art. He was then remanded by Bonner, with an order not to allow him his Bible nor candlelight. On December 4th, Mr. Philpot had his next hearing, and this was followed by two more, making in all, fourteen conferences, 
previous to the final examination in which he was condemned, such were the perseverance and anxiety of the Catholics, aided by earth argumentative abilities of the most distinguished of the papal bishops, to bring him into the pale of their church. Those examinations, which were very long and learned, were all written down by Mr. Philpot, and a stronger proof of the imbecility of the Catholic doctors, cannot, to an unbiased mind, be exhibited. On December 16, in the consistory of S.A. Paul's Bishop Bonner, after laying some trifling accusations to his charge, such as secreting powder to make ink, writing some private letters, etc., proceeded to pass the awful sentence upon him, after he and the other bishops had urged him by every inducement to recant. He was afterward conducted to Newgate, where the avaricious Catholic keeper loaded him with heavy irons, which by the humanity of Mr. Macham were ordered to be taken off. On December 17, Mr. Philpot received intimation that he was to die next day, and the next morning about eight o'clock, he joyfully met the sheriffs, who were to attend him to the place of execution. Upon entering Smithfield, the ground was so muddy that two officers offered to carry him to the stake, but he replied, Would you make me a pope? I am content to finish my journey on foot. Arriving at the stake, he said, shall I disdain to suffer at the stake, when my Redeemer did not refuse to suffer the most vile death upon the cross for me? He then meekly recited the 107th and 108th Psalms, and when he had finished his prayers, was bound to the post, and fire applied to the pile. On December 18, 1555, perished this illustrious martyr, reverenced by man, and glorified in heaven. John Lomas, Agnes Snoth, and Wright, Joan Soule, and Joan Katmare. These five martyrs suffered together, January 31, 1556. John Lomas was a young man of Tenterden. He was cited to appear at Catnerbury, and was examined January 17. His answers being adverse to the idolatrous doctrine of the papacy, he was condemned on the following day, and suffered January 31. Agnes Snoth, widow, of Smarden Parish, was several times summoned before the Catholic Pharisees, and rejecting absolution, indulgences, transubstantiation, and auricular confession, she was adjudged worthy to suffer death, and endured martyrdom, January 31st, with an right and Joan Soul, who were placed in similar circumstances, and perished at the same time, with equal resignation. Joan Catmare, the last of this heavenly company, of the parish hive, was the wife of the martyr George Catmare. Seldom in any country, for political controversy, have four women been led to execution, whose lives were irreproachable, and whom the pity of savages would have spared. We cannot but remark here that, when the Protestant power first gained the ascendancy over the Catholic superstition, and some degree of force in the laws was necessary to enforce uniformity, when some bigoted people suffered privation in their person or goods, we read a few burnings, savage cruelties, or poor women brought to the stake, but it is the nature of error to resort to force instead of argument and to silence truth by taking away existence, of which the Redeemer himself is an instance. The above five persons were burnt at two stakes in one fire, singing Hassanas to the glorified Savior, until the breath of life was extinct. Sir John Norton, who was present, wept bitterly at their unmerited sufferings. Archbishop Cranmer Dr. Thomas Cranmer was descended from an ancient family, and was born at the village of Arcelacton, in the county of Northampton. After the usual school education he was sent to Cambridge, and was chosen fellow Jesus College. Here he married a gentleman's daughter, by which he forfeited his fellowship, and became a reader in Buckingham College, placing his wife at the Dolphin Inn, the landlady of which was a relation of hers, whence arose the idle report that he was an ostler. His lady shortly after dying in childbed, to his credit he was re-chosen a fellow of the college before mentioned. In a few years after, he was promoted to be divinity lecturer, and appointed one of the examiners over those who were ripe to become bachelors or doctors in divinity. It was his principle to judge of their qualifications by the knowledge they possessed of the scriptures, rather than of the ancient fathers, and hence many popish priests were rejected, and others rendered much improved. He was strongly solicited by Dr. Capon to be one of the fellows on the foundation of Cardinal Wolsey's College, Oxford, of which he hazarded the refusal. While he continued in Cambridge, the question of Henry VIII's divorce with Catherine was agitated. At that time, on account of the plague, Dr. Cranmer removed to the house of a Mr. Cressy, at Waltham Abbey, whose two sons were then educating under him. The affair of divorce, contrary to the king's approbation, 
had remained undecided above two or three years, from the intrigues of the canonists and civilians, and though the cardinals Campius and Wolsey were commissioned from Rome to decide the question, they purposely protracted the sentence. It happened that Dr. Gardner, secretary, and Dr. Fox, defenders of the king in the above suit, came to the house of Mr. Cressy to lodge, while the king removed to Greenwich. At supper, a conversation ensued with Dr. Cranmer, who suggested that the question whether a man may marry his brother's wife or not, could be easily and speedily decided by the word of God, and this as well in the English courts as in those of any foreign nation. The king, uneasy at the delay, sent for Dr. Gardiner and Dr. Fox to consult them, regretting that a new commission must be sent to Rome, and the suit be endlessly protracted. Upon relating to the king the conversation which had passed on the previous evening with Dr. Cranmer, his majesty sent for him, and opened the tenderness of conscience upon the near affinity of the queen. Dr. Cranmer advised that the matter should be referred to the most learned divines of Cambridge and Oxford, as he was unwilling to meddle in an affair of such weight, but the king enjoined him to deliver his sentiments in writing, and to repair for that purpose to the Earl of Wiltshire's, who would accommodate him with books, a and everything requisite for the occasion. This Dr. Cranmer immediately did, and in his declaration not only quoted the authority of the scriptures, of general councils, and the ancient writers, but maintained that the Bishop of Rome had no authority whatever to dispense with the word of God. The king asked him if he would stand by this bold declaration, to which replying in the affirmative, he was deputed ambassador to Rome, in conjunction with the Earl of Wiltshire, Dr. Stokesley, Dr. Carn, Dr. Bennett, and others, previous to which, the marriage was discussed in most of the universities of Christendom and at home. When the Pope presented his toe to be kissed, as customary, the Earl of Wiltshire and his party refused. Indeed, it is affirmed that a spaniel of the earls attracted by the littler of the pope's toe, made a snap at it, whence his holiness drew in his sacred foot, and kicked at the offender with the other. Upon the pope demanding the cause of their embassy, the earl presented Dr. Cranmer's book, declaring that his learned friends had come to defend it. The pope treated the embassy honorably, and appointed a day for the discussion, which he delayed, as if afraid of the issue of the investigation. The earl returned, and Dr. Cranmer, by the king's desire, visited the emperor, and was successful in bringing him over to his opinion. Upon the doctor's return to England, Dr. Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, having quitted this transitory life, Dr. Cranmer was deservedly, and by Dr. Warham's desire, elevated to that eminent station. In this function, it may be said that he followed closely the charge of St. Paul. Diligent in duty, he rose at five in the morning, and continued in study and prayer until nine, between then and dinner, he devoted to temporal affairs. After dinner, if any suitors wanted hearing, he would determine their business with such an affability that even the defaulters were scarcely displeased. Then he would play at chess for an hour, or see others play, and at five o'clock he heard the common prayer read, and from this until supper he took the recreation of walking. At supper his conversation was lively and entertaining, again he walked or amused himself until nine o'clock, and then entered his study. He ranked high in favor with King Henry, and even had the purity and the interest of the English church deeply at heart. His mild and forgiving disposition is recorded in the following instance. An ignorant priest in the country had called Cranmer an ostler, and spoken very derogatory of his learning. Lord Cromwell receiving information of it, the man was sent to the fleet, and his case was told to the archbishop by a Mr. Chertsey, a grocer, and a relation of the priests. His grace, having sent for the offender, reasoned with him, and solicited the priest to question him on any learned subject. This the man, overcome by the bishop's good nature, and knowing his own glaring incapacity, declined, and entreated his forgiveness, which was immediately granted, with a charge to employ his time better when he returned to his parish. Cromwell was much vexed at the lenity displayed, but the bishop was ever more ready to receive injury than to retaliate in any other manner than by good advice and good offices. At the time that Cranmer was raised to be archbishop, he was king's chaplain and archdeacon of Taunton, he was also constituted by the Pope the Penitentiary General of England. It was considered by the king that Cranmer would be obsequious, hence the latter married the king to Anne Bullen, performed her coronation, stood godfather to Elizabeth, the first child, and divorced the king from Catherine. Though Cranmer received a confirmation of his dignity from the pope, he always protested against acknowledging any other authority than the king's, and he persisted in the same independent sentiments when before Mary's commissioners in 1555. 
One of the first steps after the divorce was to prevent preaching throughout his diocese, but this narrow measure had rather a political view than a religious one, as there were many who inveighed against the king's conduct. In his new dignity Cranmer agitated the question of supremacy, and by his powerful and just arguments induced the parliament to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. During Cranmer's residence in Germany, 1531, he became acquainted with Oshender, at Nuremberg, and married his niece, but left her with him while on his return to England. After a season he sent for her privately, and she remained with him until the year 1539, when the six articles compelled him to return her to her friends for a time. It should be remembered that Oshender, having obtained the approbation of his friend Cranmer, published the laborious work of the Harmony of the Gospels in 1537. In 1534 the Archbishop completed the dearest wish of his heart, the removal of every obstacle to the perfection of the Reformation, by the subscription of the nobles and bishops to the king's sole supremacy. Only Bishop Fisher and Sir Thomas More made objection, and their agreement not to oppose the succession Cranmer was willing to consider it sufficient, but the monarch would have no other than an entire concession. Not long after, Gardiner, in a privat interview with the king, spoke inimically of Cranmer, whom he maliciously hated, for assuming on the title of primate of all England, as derogatory to the supremacy of the king. This created much jealousy against Cranmer, and his translation of the Bible was strongly opposed by Stokesley, Bishop of London. It is said, upon the demise of Queen Catherine, that her successor in Bullen rejoiced a less in this to show how shallow is the human judgment. Since her own execution took place in the spring of the following year, and the king, on the day following the beheading of the sacrifice lady, married the beautiful Jane Seymour, a maid of honor to the late queen. Cranmer was ever the friend of Anne Bullen, but it was dangerous to oppose the will of the carnal tyrannical monarch. In 1538, the holy scriptures were openly exposed to sale, and the places of worship overflowed everywhere to hear its holy doctrines expounded. Upon the king's passing into a law of the famous six articles, which went nearly again to establish the essential tenets of the Romish creed, Cranmer shone forth with all the luster of a Christian passion, in resisting the doctrines they contained, and in which he was supported by the bishops of Sarum, Worcester, Ely, and Rochester, the two former of whom resigned their bishoprics. The king, though now in opposition to Cranmer, still revered the sincerity that marked his conduct. The death of Lord Cromwell in the Tower, in 1540, the good friend of Cranmer, was a severe blow to the wavering Protestant cause, but even now Cranmer, when he saw the tide directly adverse to the truth, boldly waited on the king in person, and by his manly and heartfelt pleading, caused the book of articles to be passed on his side, to the great confusion of his enemies, who had contemplated his fall as inevitable. Cranmer now lived in as secluded a manner as possible, until the rancor of Winchester preferred some articles against him relative to the dangerous opinion he taught in his family, joined to other treasonable charges. These the king himself delivered to Cranmer, and believing firmly the fidelity and assertions of innocence of the accused prelate, he caused the matter to be deeply investigated, and Winchester and Dr. Lendon, with Thornton and Barber, of the bishop's household, were found by the papers to be the real conspirators. The mild, forgiving Cranmer would have interceded for all remission of publishment, had not Henry, pleased with the subsidy voted by Parliament, let them be discharged. These nefarious men, however, again renewing their plots against Cranmer, fell victims to Henry's resentment, and Gardiner forever lost his confidence. Sir G. Ghostwick soon after laid charges against the Archbishop, which Henry quashed, and the primate was willing to forgive. In 1544, the Archbishop's palace at Canterbury was burnt, and his brother-in-law with others perished in it. These various afflictions may serve to reconcile us to a humble state, for of what happiness could this great and good man boast, since his life was constantly harassed either by political, religious, or natural crosses? Again the inveterate guardfinder laid high charges against the meek Archbishop and would have sent him to the tower, but the king was his friend, gave him his signet that he might defend him, and in the council not only declared the bishop one of the best affected men in his realm, but Sharpali rebuked his accusers for their calumny. A peace having been made, Henry, and the French king, Henry the Great, were unanimous to have the mass abolished in their kingdom, and Cranmer set about this great work, but the death of the English monarch, in 1546, suspended the procedure, and King Edward his successor continued Cranmer in the same functions, upon whose coronation he delivered a charge that will ever honor his memory, for its purity, freedom, and truth. During this reign he prosecuted the glorious reformation with unabated zeal, even in the year 1552, 
when he was seized with a severe ague, from which it pleased God to restore him that he might testify by his death the truth of that seed he had diligently sown. The death of Edward, in 1553, exposed Cranmer to all the rage of his enemies. Though the Archbishop was among those who supported Mary's accession, he was attainted Ted at the meeting of Parliament, and in November adjudged guilty of high treason at Guildhall, and degraded from his dignities. He sent a humble letter to Mary, explaining the cause of his signing the will in favour of Edward, and in 1554 he wrote to the council, whom he pressed to obtain a pardon from the Queen, by a letter delivered to drive Weston, but which the letter opened, and on seeing its contents, basely returned. Treason was a charge quite inapplicable to Cranmer, who supported the Queen's right, while others, who had favoured Lady Jane were dismissed upon paying a small fine. A calumny was now spread against Cranmer that he complied with some of the popish ceremonies to ingratiate himself with the Queen, which he dared publicly to disavow, and justified his articles of faith. The active part which the prelate had taken in the divorce of Mary's mother had ever rankled deeply in the heart of the Queen, and revenge formed a prominent feature in the death of Cranmer. We have in this work noticed the public disputations at Oxford, in which the talents of Cranmer, Ridley, and Latimer shone so conspicuously, and tended to their condemnation. The first sentence was illegal, inasmuch as the usurped power of the Pope had not yet been re-established by law. Being kept in prison until this was effected, a commission was dispatched from Rome, appointing Dr. Brooks to sit as the representative of His Holiness, and Dr. Story and Martin as those of the Queen. Cranmer was willing to bow to the authority of Dr. Story and Martin, but against that of Dr. Brooks he protested. Such were the remarks and replies of Cranmer, after a long examination, that Dr. Brooks observed, We come to examine you, and methinks you examine us. Being sent back to confinement, he received a citation to appear at Rome within eighteen days, but this was impracticable, as he was imprisoned in England, and as he stated, even had he been at liberty, he was too poor to employ an advocate. Absurd as it must appear, Cranmer was condemned at Rome, and on February 14, 1556, a new commission was appointed, by which, Thoby, Bishop of Ely, and Bonner, of London, were deputed to sit in judgment at Christchurch, Oxford. By virtue of this instrument, Cranmer was gradually degraded, by putting mere rags on him to represent the dress of an archbishop, then stripping him of his attire, they took off his own gown, and put an old worn one upon him instead. This he bore unmoved, and his enemies, finding that severity only rendered him more determined, tried the opposite course, and placed him in the house of the Dean of Christchurch, where he was treated with every indulgence. This presented such a contrast to the three years' hard imprisonment he had received, that it threw him off his guard. His open, generous nature was more easily to be seduced by a liberal conduct than by threats and fetters. When Satan finds the Christian proof against one mode of attack, he tries another. And what form is so seductive as smiles, rewards, and power, after a long, painful imprisonment? Thus it was with Cranmer, his enemies promised him his former greatness if he would but recant, as well as the Queen's favour, and this at the very time they knew that his death was determined in council. To soften the path to apostasy, the first paper brought for his signature was conceived in general terms, this once signed, five others were obtained as explanatory of the first, until finally he put his hand to the following detestable instrument. I, Thomas Cranmer, late Archbishop of Canterbury, do renounce, abhor, and detest all manner of heresies and errors of Luther and Zwinglius, and all other teachings which are contrary to sound and true doctrine. And I believe most constantly in my heart, and with my mouth I confess one holy and Catholic Church visible, without which there is no salvation, and therefore I acknowledge the Bishop of Rome to be supreme head on earth, whom I acknowledge to be the highest bishop and pope, and Christ's vicar, unto whom all Christian people ought to be subject. And as concerning the sacraments, I believe and worship in his sacrament of the altar the body and blood of Christ, being contained most truly under the forms of bread and wine, the bread, through the mighty power of God being turned into the body of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and the wine into his blood. And in the other six sacraments, also, alike as in this, I believe and hold as the universal church holdeth, and the church of Rome judgeth and determineth. Furthermore, I believe that there is a place of purgatory, where souls departed be punished for a time, for whom the church doth godily and wholesomely pray, like as it doth honour saints and make prayers to them. Finally, in all things I profess, that I do not otherwise believe than the Catholic Church and the Church of Rome holdeth and teacheth. I am sorry that I ever held or thought otherwise. And I beseech Almighty God, 
that of his mercy he will vouchsafe to forgive me whatsoever I have offended against God or his church, and also I desire and beseech all Christian people to pray for me. And all such as have been deceived either by mine example or doctrine, I require them by the blood of Jesus Christ that they will return to the unity of the church, that we may be all of one mind, without schism or division. And to conclude, as I submit myself to the Catholic Church of Christ, and to the supreme head thereof, so I submit myself unto the most excellent majesties of Philip and Mary, King and Queen of this realm of England, etc., and to all other their laws and ordinances, being ready always as a faithful subject ever to obey them. And God is my witness, that I have not done this for favor or fear of any person, but willingly and of mine own conscience, as to the instruction of others. Let him that standeth take heed lest he fall, said the apostle, and here was a falling off indeed. The papists now triumphed in their turn, they had acquired all they wanted short of his life. His recantation was immediately printed and dispersed, that it might have its due effect upon the astonished Protestants. But God counterworked all the designs of the Catholics by the extent to which they carried the implacable persecution of their prey. Doubtless, the love of life induced Cranmer to sign the above declaration, yet death may be said to have been preferable to life to him who lay under the stings of a goaded conscience and the contempt of every gospel Christian, this principle he strongly felt in all its force and anguish. The Queen's revenge was only to be satiated by Cranmer's blood, and therefore she wrote an order to Dr. Pohl, to prepare a sermon to be preached March 21st, directly before his martyrdom, at Assay. Mary's, Oxford. Dr. Pohl visited him the day previous, and was induced to believe that he would publicly deliver his sentiments in confirmation of the articles to which he had subscribed. About nine in the morning of the day of sacrifice, the Queen's commissioners, attended by the magistrates, conducted the amiable unfortunate to St. Mary's Church. His torn, dirty garb, the same in which they habited him upon his degradation, excited the commiseration of the people. In the church he found a lonely stage, erected opposite to the pulpit, on which being placed, he turned his face, and fervently prayed to God. The church was crowded with persons of both persuasions, expecting to hear the justification of the late apostasy, the Catholics rejoicing, and the Protestants deeply wounded in spirit at the deceit of the human heart. Dr. Pohl, in his sermon, represented Cranmer as having been guilty of the most atrocious crimes, encouraged the deluded sufferer not to fear death, not to doubt the support of God in his torments, nor that masses would be said in all the churches of Oxford for the repose of his soul. The doctor then noticed his conversion, and which he ascribed to the evident working of almighty power and in order that the people might be convinced of its reality, asked the prisoner to give them a sign. This Cranmer did, and begged the congregation to pray for him, for he had committed many and grievous sins, but, of all, there was one which awfully lay upon his mind, of which he would speak shortly. During the sermon Cranmer wept bitter tears, lifting up his hands and eyes to heaven, and letting them fall, as if unworthy to live, his grief now found vent in words, before his confession he fell upon his knees, and, in the following words unveiled the deep contrition and agitation which harrowed up his soul. O Father of heaven! O Son of God, Redeemer of the world! O Holy Ghost, three persons all one God. Have mercy on me, most wretched caitiff and miserable sinner. I have offended both against heaven and earth, more than my tongue can express whither then may I go, or whither may I flee. To heaven I may be ashamed to lift up mine eyes and in earth I find no place of refuge or succor. To thee, therefore, O Lord, do I run, to thee do I humble myself, saying, O Lord, my God, my sins be great, but yet have mercy upon me for thy great mercy. The great mystery that God became man, was not wrought for little or few offenses. Thou didst not give thy Son, O Heavenly Father, unto death for small sins only, but for all the greatest sins of the world, so that the sinner return to thee with his whole heart, as I do at present. Wherefore, have mercy on me, O God, whose property is always to have mercy, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for thy great mercy. I crave nothing for my own merits, but for thy name's sake, that it may be hallowed thereby, and for thy dear Son, Jesus Christ's sake. And now therefore, O Father of heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. Then rising, he said he was desirous before his death to give them some pious exhortations by which God might be glorified and themselves edified. He then descanted upon the danger of a love for the world, the duty of obedience to their majesties, of love to one another and the necessity of the rich administering to the wants of the poor. He quoted the three verses of the fifth chapter of James, and then proceeded, Let them that be rich ponder well these three sentences, 
for if they ever had occasion to show their charity, they have it now at this present, the poor people being so many, and victual so dear. And now forasmuch as I am come to the last end of my life, whereupon hangeth all my life past, and all my life to come, either to live with my master Christ forever in joy, or else to be in pain forever with the wicked in hell, and I see before mine eyes presently, neither heaven ready to receive me, or else hell ready to swallow me up, I shall therefore declare unto you my very faith how I believe, without any color of dissimulation, for now is no time to dissemble, whatsoever I have said or written in times past. First, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, etc. And I believe every article of the Catholic faith, every word and sentence taught by our Savior Jesus Christ, His Apostles and Prophets, in the New and Old Testament. And now I come to the great thing which so much troubleth my conscience, more than anything that ever I did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse, as things written with my hand contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart, and written for fear of death, and to save my life, if it might be, and that is, all such bills or papers which I have written or signed with my hand since my degradation, wherein I have written many things untrue. And forasmuch as my hand hath offended, writing contrary to my heart, therefore my hand shall first be punished, for when I come to the fire it shall first be burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy, and Antichrist, with all his false doctrine. Upon the conclusion of this unexpected declaration, amazement and indignation were conspicuous in every part of the Church. The Catholics were completely foiled, their object being frustrated, Cranmer, like Samson, having completed a greater ruin upon his enemies in the hour of death, than he did in his life. Cranmer would have proceeded in the exposure of the popish doctrines, but the murmurs of the idolaters drowned his voice, and the preacher gave an order to lead the heretic away. The savage command was directly obeyed, and the lamb about to suffer was torn from his stand to the place of slaughter, insulted all the way by the revilings and taunts of the pestilent monks and friars. With thoughts intent upon a far higher object than the empty threats of man, he reached the spot dyed with the blood of Ridley and Latimer. There he knelt for a short time in earnest devotion, and then arose, that he might undress and prepare for the fire. Two friars who had been parties in prevailing upon him to abjure, now endeavored to draw him off again from the truth, but he was steadfast and immovable in what he had just professed and publicly taught. A chain was provided to bind him to the stake, and after it had tightly encircled him, fire was put to the fuel, and the flames began soon to ascend. Then were the glorious sentiments of the martyr made manifest, then it was, that stretching out his right hand, he held it unshrinkingly in the fire until it was burnt to a cinder, even before his body was singed, frequently exclaiming, This unworthy right hand! His body did abide the burning with such steadfastness that he seemed to have no more than the stake to which he was bound, his eyes were lifted up to heaven, and he repeated this unworthy right hand, as long as his voice would suffer him, and using often the words of Stephen, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, in the greatness of the flame, he gave up the ghost. 